Hello, could somebody confirm you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> I had to go find my glasses. I left them in the bathroom. Uh, let's see. Actually, I should probably get the syllabus up first. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. I got a lot of emails. I haven't looked at my emails today, but I looked at them uh, yesterday. And uh, my Canvas <clears throat> email, for some reason, was not working last week. I definitely checked my email on Friday and maybe earlier in the week. And uh, I was surprised when I checked it, I think it was yesterday, but maybe the day before, I noticed that there were some that had not been uh, that had not been delivered until uh, whatever it was yesterday or the day before. And I'm not sure what the problem was. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Let me share my screen. So you should be seeing the uh, syllabus, the schedule right now. That's going to move. Uh, if you recall, I'm usually going to be a little bit late getting started because my clock, uh, you can see down here, it's not showing the correct time. And I need to take the computer into uh, Clark College to get this timer switched, updated. All right, today is April 11th. I'm not showing the right schedule. Well, that's bad. I think I ran into this once before. Nope, I'm in the wrong folder. There we go. Today is April 11th, and uh, we're going to be working on hopefully finishing chapter one and then starting chapter two. Realize that this Wednesday you have a practice quiz. It's practice quiz zero zero. Please do take it to get the Respondus lockdown browser up and running on your system. If you do not get it up and running on your system, and then you try and take the uh, the quiz one, for example, you will then have to contact the IT desk, meaning the computer help desk, and it may be a while before they get back to you. And if you contact them fairly late, they're not gonna be open. And if you contact them, even when they're open and fairly late, if they don't get back to you, they might get, not get back to you until a day later, which will be too late to take the quiz. So do take the practice quiz to make sure you get the Respondus lockdown browser working. Uh, the practice quiz will give you extra credit. I think it's one point for each. Oops, I don't have that here. One point of extra credit for the uh, multiple choice questions, and then one point for the uh, <clears throat> or the uh, not essay, but the short answer, fill in the blank uh, quiz. So you have two quizzes because I'm going to be giving you two types of quiz. One will be a multiple choice questions. And then that will be timed. You will be given one minute plus oh, something like three or four minutes per quiz. Uh, so one minute for a question and then plus three or four minutes extra for the quiz. And uh, the other one will be short answer, which could be just a single word you need to fill in. It may be a sentence or two. I don't think there's really any essays. But uh, uh, this one is not timed. You just need to take it anytime before 
well, any time between 8 p.m. Tuesday night and 8 p.m. Wednesday night. Uh, like I said, the the, uh, the multiple choice quiz, which I think is quiz uh, zero B in this case, uh, <clears throat> you can take it during any of that time. However, once you start it, you you have to finish within a certain amount of time, and the time will be one minute per question plus something like three or four minutes per quiz. Any question about any of that? Let me just check the extra credit points that I'm giving you. I'm taking too much time talking about this, but yeah, it's one point uh, per quiz. For the uh, quiz 00B, meaning the one that's multiple choice, uh, it will grade it, and each question you'll get will be point 0.1 point, I think. Although I probably have to go in there and manually do it, because it's going to be out of zero, so that you get it as extra credit. Any question about any of that? All right. Anything else I need to talk about this? There is a lab today. Oh, I should state that I got some grading done. Lab 00 is graded. You either get uh, full credit, which would be 2.5 points for this lab. But in the labs, the first time it's graded, you'll either get 100% or you'll get a score of 0 0.01 points. That 0 0.01 is not your score. It is a key to tell me to go back to this assignment and check and see if the student has turned in uh, a corrections and then regrade that, uh, that lab. Uh, in the lab, you will get two chances to turn it in. And your first chance was done well, this is lab zero, zero, so it was due Friday, but uh, normally the labs are due Saturday. And uh, hopefully I'll get it graded quickly. And then you will <clears throat> have almost a week. Uh, like I said, I got it graded last night. So you will have something like five or six days. And it, it the regrading, I mean, you're correct. You can turn in... Submit correct answers up until 11.59 p.m. this Saturday for those of you who did not get 100%. And I've told you what questions were wrong. Any question about any of that? In the lab, you only, this is the only assignments where you can turn it in twice to be graded. All right, I'm not hearing anything, so let's move on. Uh, oh, I, I did want to mention I have not got lab 01 graded, and I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get it graded tonight because I have to work on my taxes. And so I will probably, unless I get it graded very shortly, I will probably extend uh, the regrading of uh, lab 01, meaning it'll probably be the same time as lab two, but we will see. Uh, I'm just afraid I'm not, I'm just too overwhelmed and I don't think I'm going to get lab 01 graded uh, shortly. Any question about anything? All right, so we do have a lab tonight. It's going to be lab 02 where you'll learn about aseptic transfers. Let's begin. Uh, 
Oops, come on. We'll finish this chapter today. Is this where we left off? Anyone remember? Search. Each more than one glass, so I don't remember where we left off. Did we leave off here? Anyone? Our last yes. slide was about eukarya. So we did talk about uh, Louis Pasteur disproving spontaneous generation. I don't think so, no. Unless I'm wrong. <laughs> um, let me. Uh... I don't remember going over this. All right, let's go. Yep, I know we talked about this. I think it was 32, it's where the computer thought I left off. Okay, so we did talk about eukarya and the fungi. And did we talk about this slide where we talked about the kingdom protista? I think this is where we are, yes. Okay, all right. So the kingdom protista include three different groups actually there's even more than three different groups but there's the algae which are plant-like protists you may have cellulose in their cell walls and they gain, engage in photosynthesis to get their energy they do produce molecular oxygen as well as organic compounds like glucose the uh, second group of the protista are the protozoa and these are sometimes called the animal-like protists they include amoeba, the paramecium, and the euglena. And many of these move. <clears throat> Most of them actually move. They absorb or ingest organic chemicals. If they do move, they may move by flagella, the same as the bacteria move, as well as the archaea. But they can also move by other structures that the bacteria lack. They can move by cilia, and the paramecium has that. Actually, the volvox does there too, although you're not seeing the cilia there. And then they can move by pseudopods. And I think we talked about pseudopods earlier. Some of the protozoa are parasites. So we will talk a little bit more about them. And then there are the fungus-like protists, which are not terribly important to us because they don't cause human disease. Uh, they are important to humans because they do cause plant diseases. The most uh, famous was the uh, potato blight, which destroyed the potato crop in Ireland in, I don't remember, the 1800s or something like that, uh, causing potato blight. The eukarya include the kingdom plants, as well as the kingdom's animalia. Among the plants, we can break them into the mosses, the ferns, the conifers, and the flowering plants. All you need to know about plants is that all of them are multicellular. We're not going to talk about plants because they don't cause human disease. 
The kingdom Animalia includes the sponges, the worms, which are helminths, and the insects, and then the vertebrae. Once again, all of these are multicellular. We're not going to talk much about the animals except for the group of the worms, because the worms do cause disease among humans. When we're talking about microorganisms, we're talking about bacteria, the archaea, viruses and prions. And please understand that viruses and prions are special because they're not organisms. So we could call them microbes rather than a microorganism. You could debate whether they're alive or not. And that's only with the viruses, the prions, nobody says this are alive. Um, but they do cause disease among humans. So microbiologists study them and they're not cellular. Some of the eukarya are microorganisms, all the ones that you cannot see without the aid of a microscope. The protozoa, the molds and the yeast, some of the algae, if they're the big stuff that washes up on the Oregon or Washington oceans, that's something you can see, so it's not microscopic. But some of the algae are. And then the helminths, the worms. But the adult worms aren't microscopic, are they? The helminths are studied, for one thing, because they cause disease among humans. And microbiologists study things that cause disease among humans. And even though the adult worm is not usually microscopic, all of the infective stages of the worms, meaning the infective stage of the worm that infects humans, are microscopic. That is usually the fertilized egg, which can infect a human. But sometimes you'll have a microscopic worm that will burrow through uh, like the human skin, for example. So the helminths include um, both the um, nematodes and the platyhelminths, meaning the flatworms. Uh, and to lump them together as worms is actually a, a human egocentric concept because the uh, nematodes are as different from the platyhelminths as the nematodes are different from humans. But we lump them all together as worms, even though they are genetically very different from each other, the flatworms and the roundworms, the roundworms being the nematodes. Many of the helminths are parasitic. These are the worms that we will study in this class. The helminths are all multicellular animals. And the adults are not microorganisms, but like I stated, the stage that infects humans are all microscopic. And then some of the other life cycle stages are also microscopic. Any question about microorganisms or microbes? The viruses are a special microbe. They are acellular, meaning they lack cells. They have either DNA or RNA as their core molecule, and that is their genome. The core is surrounded by a protein coat. Some of the viruses have the coat surrounded by a lipid envelope, and they only replicate when they are in their host cell. They are not part of the three domain system. Well, for one thing, you could they're not an organism. And for the second, it's very difficult to classify viruses because their genome is so small and it evolves so quickly that we don't know the higher classifications of the viruses. Any question about any of that? When we're looking at the three domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes, 
the archaea and the bacteria have the same cell type. They're prokaryotic cells. The eukaryotes have eukaryotic cells. When we look at their chromosome, the bacteria generally have one circular chromosome. So it's a circle. The beginning place is the same place as it ends. The chromosome has no histone proteins on it. And the eukaryotes have generally many linear chromosomes, like the X chromosome has a beginning spot and an ending spot. They have histone proteins on the chromosome. Uh, the archaea are a mix between the bacteria and the eukaryotes for the chromosome. The ribosomes differ between the bacteria and the eukaryotes. The ribosomes have a, uh, the bacteria have a smaller ribosome at 70S. The eukaryotes a larger ribosome at 80S. The archaea have a smaller ribosome as well. When we look at the cell wall of bacteria, the main molecule is peptidoglycan. And the archaea and the eukaryotes have no peptidoglycan. Any questions about any of that? All right, let's talk a little bit about the history of microbiology. The history of microbiology largely concerns the debate whether spontaneous generation occurred or whether uh, the theory of biogenesis explained where life came from. The theory of biogenesis is life originates from life. Spontaneous generation is life originates from inorganic matter. The history of microbiology also uh, covers the golden age of microbiology, the start of microbiology, where wherever microbiologists looked, they would discover something new. And that was, you don't need to know the dates, but uh, 1857 to 1914. There's a little history of microbiology. We'll talk about a number of these events. This is the only date you need to know in the history of microbiology. And that is greater than 3.5 billion years ago, we have fossil records of the first living organisms, which were the ancestors of bacteria, the first life on Earth. And there you can actually see the fossil right there and there. And then this is the artist's rendition drawing. So that's the only date you need to know all of all of the dates I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to give them with a date just because it's easy to discuss them that way. But you don't need to know any of the dates except for this first one. So a long time ago, meaning 4,300 BC, the Babylonians wrote the first um, messages about microorganisms. And on their B Babylonian clay tablets, they wrote beer recipes, which they made beer by microorganisms fermenting whatever the hops you, you ferment, okay? The Babylonians didn't realize they were using microbes because, of course, they couldn't see microbes. But that's the first written record we have of microorganisms working to make beer. In 600 AD, the Mayans wrote records, and they wrote down how to make a fermented beverage from cacao, which is chocolate. So this would be kind of a liquid chocolate. It'd be very different than chocolate we have because there was no milk in it, there was no sugar in it, and um, it would be like eating pure. Uh, what do you call that? Baker's chocolate, 100% chocolate. Not terribly tasty. <laughs> All right. Uh, in the 16th century, you don't need to know the date, Janssen developed the compound microscope. This was very important because, well, it's the microscope 
we would not have ever seen microbes. Robert Hooke then used the microscope in 1665. You don't need to know the date there. And he actually looked at living tissue and living organisms. And he's the first, first person we have recorded who, who did that, used a microscope to look at living tissue. And he actually saw little boxes that he called cells. And they're called cells. Let me see if I can do this quickly. Nope. Because it reminded him of uh, the rooms in a monastery where the monks lived. It's sort of like the monk's bedroom and the monk's personal room. And uh, um, so that would be the hallway over here. And then the monk's cells would be, come on, would be like here. And the monks called these rooms cells. And that's what uh, Robert Hooke called what he was seeing in, uh, uh, in the plants that he looked at. Any question about any of that? Uh, what Robert Hooke did was he looked at uh, plants, particularly the shavings of cork. And he saw little boxes or cells that mark the beginning of the cell theory that all living things are composed of cells. This was uh, uh, developed fully and written down uh, by Virco in 16, uh, well, no, it was after 1665. The above are not specifically microbiology, but all of these things had to be done before we could look at the first microbes. Any question about any of that? Uh, let me state that uh, Robert Hooke was able to see cells in plants. He was not able to see cells in animals because animal cells lack the cell wall. And with the primitive microscopes in his day, they were too blurry to see the cells in animal tissue. It took almost 100 years with the further development of the microscope before people could finally see cells in animal cells, in animal tissue. Any question about any of that? All right, um, let me go on. I'm going to skip this just for a bit. I'll come back to it. Right there. Since we're talking about the first microbes that were seen, the first microbes that were observed and then recorded were done by this person here, Antoni van Leeuwenhoek. And I'm not Dutch, so I could be uh, butchering his name. And he was able to see the first microbes, and he found them almost everywhere he looked, like scrapings from his teeth. He found them in rainwater, in peppercorn infusions, and in the water obtained from the River Thames, which was the water that people were drinking for the city of London. He was the best microscope builder of his day. And he actually ground the lens himself and then built a microscope. And this is one of the microscopes that he actually built, kind of primitive. It only had one lens. So it was not a compound microscope. It was a simple microscope. And it's essentially just a super duper magnifying lens, okay? But he was such a good microscope builder and lens grinder that he was able to see cells that were so small that they weren't seen again for almost a century. 
And here he did a drawing here. And if you know any bacteria, there is a bacilli, there's a bacilli, there's a spirillum. Right e here, E is cocci, and there are more uh, bacilli. He was able to see bacteria, which were cells so small that nobody else saw them for 100 years. And what happened was, after 100 years, they got better and better microscopes, and then other people could actually see bacteria. Any question about any of that? All right, let's go back to where we were. So the history of microbiology can largely uh, concerns two hypotheses to explain how life began. Spontaneous generation, where life could arise from inorganic matter. And the theory was a vital force came into the organic matter from outside and then animated the organic matter, and then life would spontaneously generate. The other theory was biogenesis, and that is life arises from pre-existing life. And everybody would agree, even back then, that a baby came from two parents, okay? But back then, people did believe in spontaneous generation of uh, life. And it came about from a lot of... Uh, uh, beliefs which were, I don't know, amusing and uh, curious beliefs, but not necessarily scientific. And that is when people threw a log into the fire, sometimes a newt would crawl out of the fire. And people would say, ah, the newt spontaneously generated. We threw the wood, the log into the fire, fire and wood spontaneously generation of the news. And then people saw flies emerging from manure and they'd say, ah, oh, there's more proof of spontaneous generation. The same with maggots arising from a decaying corpse. Most were logical, but not scientific. Some were amusing, like somebody wrote that if you put sweaty underwear in a jar, and put wheat in the bottom of the jar, it would spontaneously give rise to mice. In reality, the mice climbed into the jar to get at the wheat, and because of the jar, the mice were unable to climb out of the jar. Okay, the sweaty underwear had nothing to do with it. A brief sidetrack on... Uh, 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 spontaneous generation, and that is when you have no growth in a media of glass tube, the media will be clear. If you have growth growing in the tube, the media will be cloudy. We call that turbidity. And back when people were arguing about spontaneous generation, they would put clear media in that had been sterilized by boiling and then let it cool. And then it would become turbid. And people would say, ah, oh, spontaneous generation of the media. In reality, the bacteria were either in the tube to begin with, or they fill, fell into the tube from the air. The debate over spontaneous generation was first scientifically experimented by Francesco Reddy in 1668. You don't need to know the date. You just need to know Francesco Reddy was the first person who gave evidence uh, disproving spontaneous generation. And you should know Francesco Reddy because this is actually the first controlled scientific experiment where he controlled the variables and then he wrote up his experiment. What he did was he got three jars 
and he put meat in them and he left the jar open and he got three jars and he sealed the jars. The jars that he left open, maggots arose in the meat. The jars that he sealed had no maggots in them. People said, oh, you sealed the jar. So that prevented the vital force from coming into the meat. You have to leave the jar open for the maggots to arise. And so what he did was he took three jars, he put meat in them, and then he covered the jar with a fine wire uh, mesh netting. And he found no maggots in them. What happened was the, the, the uh, wire netting prevented flies from coming in and then laying eggs in the meat. And that's why the three completely sealed jar and then the jars with the wire netting over them did not get any maggots, whereas the three open jars did get maggots. So this did not support the theory of spontaneous generation. And after Francesco Reddy's time, people agreed that spontaneous generation did not happen in complex uh, living organisms, obviously a baby and then maggots. However, people would argue that spontaneous generation did happen in the microbes. And part of the reason is, even if you put wire mesh over this jar, you'll get bacteria coming in from the air and then you'll get uh, growth of the uh, media, growth in the media. You don't need to know when uh, Rudolf Virchow proposed the cell theory, stating that cells can only arise from pre existing living cell cells. And this became known as the concept of biogenesis. I'm only mentioning it because this is when the theory of biogenesis was strictly written down. However, the theory of biogenesis had been held by many people for about a uh, uh, hundred years before uh, 1858. The argument about whether spontaneous generation of microbes could occur or not continued until 1861. And how the uh, argument was settled was Louis Pasteur came of age and he disproved the spontaneous generation, therefore by confirming the biogenesis theory because of his work. First of all, he showed that there are microorganisms present in the air and they can contaminate the liquid media. The, he also showed that microbes can be destroyed by heat. And then he did an ingenious, famous, swan neck flask experiment to test the theory of spontaneous generation. What he did was he poured his media in the flask. There's the neck of the flask, long neck. And then he heated this part here and bent it into a swan neck. And then he heated the media to sterilize it. And he found that there was no microbes growing in the media in this condition, even though it was open to the outside so the vital force could get in it, okay? He then showed that if you put the media down here and then bring the media back, that the media would be contaminated and microbes would grow in it. What happened was the uh, microbes from the air fall down into the tube, but they stay here because of gravity. They don't go up gravity. And that keeps this sterile. In our lab, if you happen to ever go by the microbiology lab at Clark, you can find that uh, 
one of our instructors made one of these and it's sitting in the window of our lab and it's been there for over 10 years. It might be over 15 years now. And there's nothing ever growing in the flask. Any question about any of that? So after Louis Pasteur's work, the theory of spontaneous generation has been disproved. And therefore the theory of biogenesis has been confirmed. With Pasteur's work came a lot of discoveries, including the relationship between microbes and disease. This became known as the germ theory of disease, that germs could cause disease. This also gave rise to the work on immunity, and that is our bodies have an immune system that fights disease, and if you become immune to something, we call that immunity, meaning the, you become immune so you cannot get the disease. And it also gave rise to the work on antimicrobial drugs where we found chemicals that we could use against microbes. And we call it a drug because it can... Uh, um, help us out and kill off the microbes. Any question about any of that? All right, about this time, Pasteur developed the basic idea of a septic technique. And he did that because he wanted to study a pure culture. And if you don't use a septic technique, you contaminate the culture. And then you can't study the culture because there's more than one species in it. So if you use a septic technique, you can keep a culture pure. Uh, slightly after that, Koch developed the technique for streaking for isolation on solid media, meaning Pasteur did come up with getting a pure culture, but it was very laborious. You had to uh, make many different dilutions. And then you would replicate each of those dilutions. So you had 10 tubes of each different dilution. And if you ever got only one tube having growth and nine tubes having no growth, Louis Pasteur said that the growth in that one tube was probably started by one cell so it's probably pure, okay? But like I said, it was very difficult getting a pure culture by Louis Pasteur as well. Cox came up with an easy method for getting a pure culture, and that is you just streak on a auger plate or a solid media. You put down a single cell, that single cell can then give rise to an isolated colony. And that colony, if it started by one cell, would be a pure culture. Of course, uh, when you do that, only about 70% of the colonies are really pure, meaning the other 30% are, are formed by at least two cells or maybe a clump of cells. And so what you want to do is take from a single colony and then streak it out again, getting single colonies, and then take from a single colony and this has gone through two colony formation events, those cells are now a pure culture. And that's not a 100% sure thing, but it's over 95% of the sure thing. Shortly after that, Hess, one of the uh, technicians working in Dr. Cox's lab, developed nutrient auger, a new solid medium for growing many microbes. And we still use it today because it's cheap and it grows many microbes. And then about that time, uh, Sergei Winogreski developed the concept that microorganisms are involved in the biogeochemical cycles, such as the nitrogen cycle and the sulfur cycle. We talked about the nitrogen cycle where Nitrogen moves from one place and one form in the earth 
to another place and another form of nitrogen. And uh, Dr. Winogradsky was able to do that because he was actually not working with pure cultures. He was working with large communities of microorganisms. And to discover the biogeochemical cycles, you have to work with communities of microbes. You can't work with a pure culture. Any question about any of that? All right, Louis Pasteur went on to show that microbes were responsible for fermentation. He actually worked with alcoholic fermentation, showing that microorganisms convert the sugar to alcohol. And that is why we get beer and wine from the fermentation of sugar by a microorganism. And in this case, it's by beer. Uh, Louis Pasteur then went on to show that the beer and the wine can be spoiled by microbes growing in the beer and the wine, spoiling it, and producing acetic acid from the alcohol, meaning it is true that the either the uh, grains for beer or the usually grape juice for wine are fermented by a microbe into alcohol, but there are other microbes which can ferment alcohol and they will change the alcohol into acetic acid, making it sour and spoiling the beer or the wine. In fact, if you don't know, uh, you take alcohol and ferment it and that's how we get vinegar, which is mainly acetic acid. Any question about any of that? Louis Pasteur also showed that the spoilage bacteria could be killed by heat. And if you apply a heat that is hot enough to harm the spoilage bacteria, but not hot enough to evaporate all of the alcohol from the beer or the wine, you can um, protect the beer or the wine. And this is called pasteurization the application of a high heat for a short period of time to improve the shelf life of the, of the agent, like the beer or the wine by Louis Pasteur. Uh, pasteurization is most often used with milk and pasteurized milk has a longer shelf life than unpasteurized milk because the heat and of pasteurization does kill off all of the pathogenic microbes, meaning microbes that can cause human disease. And it kills off many of the microbes in the milk, but it does not kill off all of the microbes in the milk. And that is why pasteurized milk does have a shelf life. Any questions about any of that? All right. Pasteurization is what used, used widely in a variety of foods. It is used much more often than just on uh, milk or uh, beer and wine. Any question about any of that? I think beer is frequently pasteurized. A wine is sometimes pasteurized, but is sometimes not. And I'm not sure with wine uh, what they do. It might have a high enough alcohol content that, uh, that um, pathogens don't grow in it. I don't know what they do but with wine. If anyone knows, you can state it. I know with beer, they mainly ferment it. I mean, not ferment it. They mainly pasteurize the beer. Any question about any of that? All right. Pasteur's work on the fermentation 
that microbes can affect organic matter and then change the organic matter led to the concept of could microbes be doing the same thing with plants and animals? Could microbe grow on a organism and then cause disease? This idea became known as the germ theory of disease. The disease was caused by a microorganism. This was an important advancement because originally people believed that it was poisonous vapors that were responsible for at least some infectious diseases. A classic case, cholera. People got cholera from walking through the swamp and then breathing in the poisonous vapors in the swamp. That was the old theory. In reality, the people walked through the swamp and then breathed in the germs that were in the swamp, and then the germs caused the cholera, meaning bacteria caused the cholera. Any question about any of that? Um, I don't think I talk about this, but Ingnes Schmelo Weiss, sorry, I'm not German, uh, came up with the concept that doctors should wash their hands and if they do, they will prevent, prevent the transmission of postpartum and puri pearl, sorry, fever uh, among OB patients. And so the, he was in charge of the, uh, oh, what do you call that? The nursery or the, the uh, birthing station. And uh, he had his doctors wash their hands, and then that prevented the, the infection of the, uh, of the pregnant woman. Actually, it greatly improved, actually, the lifespan of the, the woman. Um, not the lifespan, but her, her, her ability to survive the birth. It did improve the ability of a woman to survive the birth. Uh, surprisingly, he was fired by the president of the hospital because he was insulted that uh, he was um, advocating that doctors wash their hands before they do anything in the hospital. Uh, Schemmelweiss was only in charge of the department of the birthing, whatever you call that in the hospital, the OB department. In the 19th century, you don't need to know the year, Joseph Lister used a chemical disinfectant to prevent surgical wounds. And this dramatically reduced surgery-related infections. The chemical he used was um, oh, benzene, is that right? Which uh, is actually fairly, well, noxious. It's not exactly toxic, but it's not um, a, a chemical you'd want on your skin for long periods of time, and it would give you a headache because of its fumes. And then it also, many years later, could give you cancer. So uh, that's not one we tend to use anymore, but uh, it was the first chemical, and Joseph Lister used this chemical uh, to prevent surgery infections by microbes. Uh, the germ theory of disease was actually proved by Robert Koch, who proved that the bacterium Bacillus anthraxis causes the disease anthrax. And then uh, Dr. Koch wrote up his experimental steps he used to prove that Bacillus anthraxis causes the disease anthrax. And these are used as steps to prove that a specific microbe causes a specific disease. And these steps are called Cox postulates. Cox postulates is one of the topics we will talk about three times this term. So this is the first time you're going to be exposed to it. 
And at the moment, we're just saying it was Dr. Koch who did it. And he used Cox postulates to show that Bacillus anthraxis causes the disease anthrax. He then formulated his postulate in 1884. You don't really need to know about that, but um, he showed the first evidence of an organism causing disease. Any question about that? About this time was the first time someone had showed how to prevent disease, and that was Edward Jenner, who came up the first vaccinations against smallpox. Smallpox was a deadly disease, killing about 20% of the people that it infected. And he, what he did for his vaccine was he inoculated people with a cowpox virus. The person was then protected against smallpox. And then the cowpox virus was used as a vaccine to prevent people getting smallpox. It was not understood why cowpox was protecting against smallpox in Edward Jenner's day. And it was not understood until Louis Pasteur came on the scene and then he experimented with, with it. Uh, mainly he experimented with a, I think it was a chicken virus causing chicken disease. And he experimented and showed that what's happening with the vaccine is the vaccine is similar enough to the organism causing disease that when the immune system responds to the vaccine, it will also protect against the disease. So in the case of cowpox, the two viruses are similar, cowpox and smallpox, and similar enough that when you give cowpox, your immune system, when it responds to cowpox, it will also respond to smallpox. And from Louis Pasteur's work, we were then able to make more vaccines because people now understood why vaccines were working. And Louis Pasteur did give rise to a number of vaccines himself. Like I mentioned, the first one he did was uh, some vaccine against the chicken disease. And I think people know he also did the vaccine against rabies, and he did another vaccine that I don't recall off the top of my head. The word vaccination is actually derived from the word vaca, which is a word for cow. So vaccination is a word for cow, and it comes down to the the fact that the first vaccine was derived from cowpox. And then the protection that the vaccine gives is called immunity. Any question about any of that? All right. About this same time, we got the concept of chemotherapy, where we could treat disease with specific chemicals. And Paul Ehrlich was the person who was promoting this. He called it a magic bullet to find a chemical that could prevent disease. Chemotherapeutic agents are agents that we use against an infectious disease. They can be synthetic drugs or they can be antibiotics. Antibiotics, strictly speaking, and this is a textbook definition, is a chemotherapeutic agent used against a bacteria that is man-made by another, not man-made, sorry, <laughs> that is not man-made, that is naturally made by another organism usually a bacteria or a fungi. 
an example of an antibiotic is penicillin G. It is made by the penicillium mold. However, carboxacillin is not made by an organism. It is man-made. And so this member of the penicillin family is not an antibiotic by this definition. Okay? Uh, clinicians and then the general public at large do not use the textbook definition of an antibiotic. To them, an antibiotic is an antibacterial drug that we use against bacteria. Okay? And let me state that we don't usually call uh, a chemotherapeutic agent an antibiotic or vice versa. Chemotherapeutic agents or chemotherapy is nowadays used to treat cancer. So a chemotherapeutic agent or drug would be a drug that we use to uh, treat cancer, okay? But strictly speaking, chemotherapeutic agent is any agent against any infectious disease. You won't find it used that way in the general public, and I don't think in the clinic either. And the same thing with an antibiotic. Generally, clinicians do not say that penicillin G is an antibiotic, but carboxacillin is not, okay? They are in the same family, and we usually just say that uh, they are an antibiotic. I am telling you, though, the book's definition, because you do need to answer your questions for the book's definition. Any question about that? All right. Now, the first chemotherapeutic agent was long... Well, we should, I won't say that yet. Not yet. The first, yeah, I'll say it. The first chemotherapeutic agent was discovered long before the concept of a magic bullet or a, a antibiotic was conceived. The first uh, drug that we ever came into being came into Europe sometime in the 1600s. I think it was the 1650s. And what happened was Jesuit missionaries in Peru or close to there, I think it was Peru, noticed the natives eating the bark of the cinchona tree or the cinchona tree, depending on how you pronounce it. Both pronunciations are correct. So I'll say cinchona tree. They're eating the bark of the cinchona tree, which had quinine in the bark. And quinine is an anti-malaria drug. And so the first anti-malaria drug that showed up in Europe showed up in the 1650s and all it was was the bark of the Sincona tree. Any question about that? Now, Paul Ehrlich went through one chemical after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, so that people in his lab put a sign outside the, the uh, lab door saying something like, I, I might not quite get it correct, but... Uh, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Because it was a lot of work going through one chemical after another. And, and it wasn't until he had tested something like 500 chemicals that he ever came up with one that was antibacterial. He came up with a uh, synthetic arsenic drug Salvar Sen, which he used to treat syphilis as early as 1910. And he called this a magic bullet, a drug which could harm the, the infective agent. Any question about any of that? 
All right, we don't use Solvar Sen anymore because as you can imagine, an arsenic drug would be fairly toxic to people. And if you've ever used arsenic, you know that, right? All right, so in 1910, Ehrlich came up with the first drug to cure syphilis. It wasn't until 1928 that Alexander Fleming discovered the first antibiotic. And what he discovered was penicillin G. What he did was he streaked out a plate and he was pretty sloppy microbiologist and he got the plate contaminated with some fungi mold. And then for some reason, he grew it at room temperature so that both the bacteria and the mold would grow. And then he left it at room temperature over the weekend, came back, saw the plate, and he noticed that in the region around the mold, there was no growth of the bacteria. And he correctly hypothesized that something was coming out of the mold and preventing the growth of the bacteria. And he was not able to, uh, what do you call that? Purify the chemical coming out of the mold because in 1928, technology just wasn't available to do that type of work. But in the 1940s, technology became available and we uh, were able to isolate penicillin G from this mold, penicillium mold. Any question about any of that? All right, so penicillin G was the first antibiotic discovered, but it was not the first antibiotic that was clinically available. And the first clinically available antibiotic was sulfonamide, a sulfur drug. And this was a man-made drug. So because they man-made it, it was fairly easy to purify and then administer. And so it was the first uh, antibiotic that was clinically available. If there's time, I'll try and... Uh, tell you the story of the first two patients who re received penicillin G treatment. So you have to remind me to tell you that. In the 1940s, meaning World War II, penicillin uh, was finally purified from the fluid of the, the small and then became clinically available. Any question about any of that? All right, when we're talking about microbes and human disease, you should realize that bacteria were once classified as plants. And that's where the term flora for a microbe uh, comes from. However, microflora, is not a good term to describe bacteria. So we've changed that name to microbiota or the normal microbiota. The normal microbiota are those microbes that are normally present in and on a host. Animals and plants host a symbiotic microbial community, which is very large. And this community is the, the host uh, normal microbiota. And the normal microbiota are central to their host welfare. For example, in humans, we have a large part, up to 33% of vitamin K, and one of the B vitamins, I'm not sure if it's nitocin or riboflovin. You don't need to know that. But one of the B vitamins, we get a significant amount of these vitamins from our normal microbiota in our gut. Any question about any of that?
All right, the normal microbiota are usually found in and on the skin, the oral and nasal cavities, the respiratory tract, the digestive and the urethra. The normal microbiota is not normally found in the internal tissues or organs, such as in the blood or the brain. And if it is found in the blood or the brain, that would be a disease. Okay, that's not normally the way a normal individual has microbes. You don't normally have microbes internal to the body. And that's because our immune system will kill it off if it tries to grow in the body. And if we do have it growing in the body, it causes disease. The normal microbiota can prevent the growth of pathogens. They can compete for space or resources. The normal microbiota may also secrete toxins that inhibit the growth of pathogens. Did I mention that uh, I read, this has got to be over five years ago, that uh, they were uh, looking at these toxins secreted by the normal microbiota that inhibit the growth of certain pathogen. And we were using these bacterial toxins as an antibiotic, except it's very specific and uh, it's much more specific than a narrow acting antibiotic. Meaning these toxins generally only work on one or a few species of bacteria. The normal microbiota helps us produce nutrients and growth factors. The normal microbiota helps us digest our food. So the normal microbiota is extremely important for all living organisms. Any question about any of that? The normal microbiota do not normally cause disease. However, they can cause disease under certain circumstances. For example, uh, E. coli is normally in our intestines and colon, but if it were to grow elsewhere, like in the ear or in the lungs, that would be disease being caused by E. coli. And another example is in AIDS patients, they don't have a functioning immune system. And so the normal microbiota may start growing in the patient and then that would cause disease. Any question about any of that? All right, I think we're just gonna finish this lesson although I've been going kind of fast, infectious diseases. This results when a pathogen overcomes the host resistance. And an infectious disease is caused by a pathogenic microbe. Remember, only a few microbes are pathogenic, meaning a few percentage of bacteria are pathogenic. Most bacteria are not pathogenic. We have an emerging infectious disease, and this is a new disease that is increasing or a disease which is changing and has the potential to increase in incidence. Can anyone name a emerging infectious disease? Come on, we got one. We got several actually, but there's one going around right now. COVID? Yeah, COVID-19 is an emerging infectious disease. Before 2019, this never caused disease, at least in humans. It may have shortly evolved in 2019. Another one would be the bird flu, which it's not increasing in frequency right now, 
but they fear it has the potential to increase in the future. That's the only thing you need to know about emerging infectious disease, what it is. I will not ask any questions further about emerging infectious diseases. All you need to know is what it is. And I'm going to skip all of these slides. You're not going to be tested on any of these slides. Any questions about any of that? All right. We finished this lesson. Good job. Let's put two here, here, just in case I look. All right. Any questions? If not, I'll see you at 6.30 in the lab.